Hello, and welcome to another episode of Outlier Academy, where we decode what iconic founders, renowned investors, best-selling authors, and outlier thinkers have mastered and what they've learned along the way. In each episode, we dive deep to uncover the tools, strategies, habits, routines, and hacks that we can all apply in our own work and lives. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on the show today, I'm joined by Jivko Bajanov, who played professional tennis before co-founding ShipBob with Dhruv Saxena and Divi Gulati in 2014. Jibco is currently the Senior Vice President of Strategic Projects at ShipBob, and over the last eight years, he's led the development and launch of almost every major strategic initiative at ShipBob, from their transition from owning their own fulfillment centers to developing an asset light partner network of fulfillment centers to the launch of affordable two-day shipping for all of ShipBob's customers. Listen in as we decode how ShipBob has grown from shipping orders from the co-founder's apartment to running a network of 30-plus fulfillment centers located around the world that over 7,000 brands use ship orders everywhere their customer shop, including brands like 100 Thieves, Spikeball, Tom Brady's TV2, and more. You can find a searchable transcript for this episode, as well as our episode guide with ways to dive deeper at outlieracademy.com slash 138. That's outlieracademy.com slash 138. Please enjoy my conversation with ShipBob co-founder and SVP of Strategic Projects, Jivko Bajanov. Jipko, I'm thrilled to have you on Outlier Academy as part of our Outlier Founder Series to profile ShipBob, which you're a co-founder at and you've been building for a number of years now. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Super excited to be here. So we're going to get into it because we have a lot of ground to cover today. As I was preparing for this interview, I have so many questions for you around logistics and fulfillment and different aspects, the physical, the digital aspects of your business. Where I wanted to start, just to kind of give everyone a bit of, of background, is if you could share a quick sketch of your background and just kind of your journey up to meeting your co-founders and founding ShipBob. Yeah, absolutely. So I was born and raised in, in Bulgaria and uh, my, my family immigrated to the States in the mid nineties. Did a, so, some non, non-normal things to, to uh, until graduating college. But uh, after graduating, I, uh, for my first three years out of school, I uh, moved uh, abroad to to Beijing, China, and, and I worked at an education startup. And then I moved back to the States and, and started a, a, a startup of my own that was in the travel education space and then realized that it's, it, it was a great kind of like family business, but not something that would uh, scale and be a, a huge market opportunity and uh, wasn't really sure what to do at that state. And I, and I went back to get my MBA and I was, I was hoping to find co-founders and I'm very lucky to, to make it out of the MBA program, not in consulting, but, but to, <laughs> to have found <laughs> co-founders. Uh, and that's where, uh, through the Illinois MBA program is how uh, Deve and I got connected. Deve was an alum, I was halfway through. And yeah, and then Deve and Drew, their childhood friends, uh, and we got connected, started talking about the idea of Shabab. Uh, this was like pre YC at the time, and yeah, I, I joined them at first as an intern, and then spent three months, twenty hours a day building, <laughs> building Shabab, and uh, and then it felt uh, like a, a child that that I had raised, and it was difficult to to let it go, and I uh, dropped out of school, uh, and joined them as a founder uh, to to build a company from there. And when, you know, normally I'd ask more questions to kind of get everyone from zero to one on ShipBob, but we have so much to cover. I'm just going to try to keep this portion a little bit short. Can you just, for people listening that maybe aren't familiar, describe at a high level what ShipBob does today, and then just give a little bit of backstory, how long, you know, the business has been around when you guys got founded, when you went through YC, and maybe some stats around customers and where you are today. Yeah. ShipBob is focused on e-commerce logistics for for small and mid-sized businesses around the globe. We own and operate and partner with, with, with fulfillment centers across uh, the states. The number keeps increasing on a weekly basis, so I, I'm going to get around, but, it, but it's north of 30 right now in the states. And that's warehouses? or Yes, yeah, yep. fulfillment centers. Yep, and, uh, and we are at six globally. And we're helping folks uh, that essentially need help with logistics across, like uh, primarily in the warehouse, uh, pick back and ship space, but uh, uh, logistics all across as well. We got founded in 2014 uh, and uh, with with the idea of of helping e-commerce businesses be more successful online. Or in the early days, we we had a different solution to the problem than what we currently do now, uh, but very quickly 
learned and, and evolved. And present day, uh, we, we service north of 7,000 uh, merchants and uh, operate globally. Fantastic overview. And I think for people listening, if I, uh, you know, you maybe you knew what ShipBob was, I think the scale you guys have achieved is really impressive. Um, and so that's what you see. I think you said 30 fulfillment centers in the US and then six outside of the US based around the world. Correct. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. And 7,000 customers. I want to start to get into some of the basics of ShipBob, and then we're going to talk about fulfillment and um, go into the weeds there because I think it's a super interesting area that people will like. One of the things I want to start with is just the origin story of ShipBob. And I'll try to kind of paraphrase what I've heard, what I've gathered, and then you can maybe push back on that and help me refine it. But the origin story, as I you know understand it, is your two other co-founders had a previous business, and they were basically able to automate all other parts of the business except fulfillment. And so fulfillment was this really challenging thing, this really frustrating thing that kept taking up all their time and that they couldn't automate. And so for their next company, they wanted to focus just on fulfillment. Do I have that story right? And is there anything else around the kind of origins that you think is interesting? You got it. Like uh, Deve and Drew were both, you know, software engineers and their startup time was like their lunch hour, you know, in their jobs. And they spend that time at the post office. So uh, (laughs) uh, that that was a pain point. Uh, And I think a lot of folks that are starting out in e-commerce, like would relate. Like it's a very obvious pain point early on in your e-commerce journey. One of the other things you know that I heard was that um, you know you guys ended up getting a lot of your original customers by literally just standing outside of a UPS store. I think you had these like ship captains hats in the early days as a form of kind of guerrilla marketing. Talk about that and why that why that made sense. Why that was the right way to go about learning more. We had entered YC and. Um, uh, a big thing in Y Combinator is, is coming up with a one North Star metric and reporting on that weekly. And for us, it was number of shipments. So week over week, we had to do we had to do more shipments, whatever it took. And on week two, had not been, been at the numbers that we needed to be. <laughs> we started to brainstorm it, and at the time, I was leading our, our sales and marketing efforts, and we're brainstorming like we need to have like packages today, like right now. Like, how do we do this? And like, where are the people with packages? And, and we're like, well, they're, they're at the post office. Like, okay, great. Like, so we need to go to the post office <laughs> and meet these people and talk to them. And uh, yeah. And on literally like the, the, one of the very first shipments we got was uh, a lady who was, uh, who was just exiting the post office with all her stuff. And she just got rejected by the post office to ship her things because they weren't packaged. And uh, we, we had, like just arrived there <laughs> and we're not wearing like any shit Bob branding or there's no like hat at the time, t-shirt or anything, and and told her about our, our solution and service. And and this lady, like, you know, like I just remember the look on her face, like she thought it was a miracle that this had happened to her. <laughs> and gave her all our stuff. And like we wrote, I think at the time, like we wrote down her like credit card number on a sheet of paper. It was like completely <laughs> very, very startup startup age. But it was just a, a, a like talk about the problem. Like this, this person like complete like was in so much pain that willing to trust, you know, these random people that just came up to you on the street with all your stuff and your payment information. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but we got a, a lot of our, our original customers sending outside the post office and pitching them from that time of when they left their car before the post office door and wearing our heart on a sleeve there and, and taking those 30 seconds to get feedback essentially on, on, on our product. And, um, So like, uh, I think something cool about like learning, you mentioned that the ship captain hat, like learning from your environment, uh, there was a gentleman who was selling streetwise by the post office as well. And he was really successful getting people to come in because he had a puppet and we're like, oh my goodness, like we need, we need, we need, we need something to get people to come talk to us. So the ship captain hats naturally evolved, uh, real thing. (laughs) I love it. What problem were you solving for those customers in those very early days? Like thinking about that woman, is it basically the the pitch was you never have to go and ship packages to the post office again. You effectively ship Bob takes over, we'll package, we'll handle shipping. What was the value proposition? What were you selling customers on? Exactly. So uh, the, the the value prop was that we, we would come to you and we'll pick up your items. They, they could be in an un, unpacked state and then we will package them, take them to the post office or UPS or FedEx whatever is most cost effective and then provide you with obviously just a much better like experience. And we were looking at reviews of like the worst post offices to go stand out in front of, you know, to find that, that gap of, of, it's the not hard. <laughs> of experience. Um, 
And that business model quickly evolved to like we were we were picking up from from businesses where every day at the same time at like 4 p.m. we'd go and have the same package and and then and the folks started saying, you know what, like I feel like I'm wasting my time always meeting you here at 4 p.m. Can you just like take this box? When it's 4 p.m., just like ship it out from me. Like, can you do that? And the light bulb, you know, went off that uh, that this is a service that um, uh, where warehousing and fulfillment it is really the, the evolution of the need here, and something that also opened up our market from being just city local to to servicing companies all over the world. And we very quickly started developing our technology about operating warehouses and inventory management and all the things that, that come with running fulfillment centers. One of the things that I want to talk about for a second, because I think this is going to be a theme that we go back to throughout the episode, is that fulfillment is really challenging. Like, you know, for all of these customers, it's it's interesting to me that, you know, here you guys were looking at all of these people that were basically all suffering with the same thing, which was, we, God, just fulfillment takes so much work. It takes so much energy and effort. It takes so much time to go and do, but it's an important part of our business. I think a lot of founders would maybe look at that problem and be like, whew, that seems really difficult. <laughs> I don't know if I want to go tackle fulfillment. What made you guys excited to focus on that problem? And what insights do you have around why fulfillment is so hard? Why is that such a hard problem to solve for people? I guess on, on the part about like what made us excited about it. One, I mean, like like we felt the pain. I had felt it shipping, uh, like selling stuff on eBay. And, and when I met Dev Andrew and we started talking about it, like it was very, it, it resonated. And so, and then seeing just, you know, uh, the, the feedback from merchants there, but so it was a big pain point, very big market opportunity. And it was a growing segment. If you started to like e-commerce is, is growing year over year. And then if you drill down into like, where is it growing more? And even from in 2014, you would you would see that Shopify stores and WooCommerce stores, et cetera, are becoming a greater portion of the e-commerce market versus Amazon, who at the time had a, a greater percentage of the US e-commerce share. Businesses with founders like like that that were just starting up that that were probably going through the same challenges that you know we're ha- that we we're having. So the problem was there, the market was there. So it it was it was hard to say let's 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 do something else when we had already like lived through it, and then what makes fulfillment difficult? I think like Drew and the uh, uh, my co-founder in the very early early days, like once we we went to an actual like sorting center at UPS and the post office, and once you realize like how many hands touch a package or you know a good that you buy before you make it to your door, you will be surprised that it gets there. Like it's it's crazy how many different touch points and conveyor belts and you know whatever it goes through to get there and for an e-commerce business it's it there's challenges along their like life cycle of the company first when you're doing it yourself and when you get to a point of like moving into your garage and then outgrowing your garage there's all different phases of of growth and complexity that change your problems like keep keep evolving (laughs) and your solutions to, to, to be more efficient and then when you put that on the backdrop of like what the customer wants and then who you're competing against, which is the expectations that I have from Amazon, from Walmart now, from, from all, all these other e-commerce players is they want things quicker and they want them cheaper. And that's going to continue happening. Over the next five to 10 years, like those two trends are not going to change. People are going to want things cheaper and they're going to want them quicker. So for small businesses to compete with that, it's really difficult. And building ShipBob into a solution where we can give small and mid-sized businesses like the power to leverage logistics and to tap into a network that can give their customers that experience is uh, has been phenomenal. Yeah. Oh, I love that point. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to argue that people are going to continually want things faster to get to them faster and to get to them more cheaply. What that also kind of means, you know, I imagine if I put myself in your guys' shoes is great. That means over time, no individual is going to be able to do shipping on their own and really be able to fulfill what customers are looking for. Everyone's going to need a solution like ShipBob. And then you guys can effectively build this flywheel to continue to deliver you know, better delivery times at better prices for merchants. And so in that way, if you frame it up and just look at the data, it would seem to be almost a no-brainer type business to start. 
Yeah, it'd be fun. Like if if all the VCs had that like mindset in 2014. <laughs> well, no, it's I think they do on the vision part, and then they learn the costs and what it takes, and they're like, oh, okay, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe not. I wanted to ask a little bit of a question. We talked about starting ShipBob and why you started it and why, you know, why the problem was interesting. We talked about getting some of these initial customers. Um, and you also gave the example of how in any merchant's life, you know, they go, if their business continues to grow, they go through different periods where they have different challenges, which makes sense. That also immediately makes me think of ShipBob because I imagine you guys have been through all of those progressions of starting off really small, maybe even in one of your apartments, then moving into bigger facilities over time. So one of the questions I want to ask is when you think back to those early years, how hard was it to scale the business? And then two, was there a tipping point when you felt like you reached escape velocity? And if so, what was that? Yeah. So b- building a, you know, a business that it's rooted in infrastructure and works with so many people is not easy by any means. In retrospective, it's a great moat, but, but also it's, it, it's, it's been a difficult journey. And we started out in an apartment on the, on the 31st floor uh, <laughs> in a condo building in Chicago, which is not a good place to have your warehouse. And then quickly grew into uh, proper warehouses uh, across Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and across the country. I think that the interesting and like difficult things is like you, uh, we're, we're a technology company first. So like we, we've been building tech from the start and the way technology interacts with like our merchants and then also like people inside the warehouse. And for the first four years of being in business, ShipBob owned and operated all, all of our facilities. And we really honed in that technology of how that works with people on the floor, how that works with like middle managers, uh, you know, facility managers, and how all that can, can run really smoothly, but also like can be replicated really easily so that it becomes, you can, you can imbue m- more of the technology replication and scalability to the space of, of warehousing. So that, that is the biggest thing that we wrestled with the first you know, four or five years of our journey. And then the tipping point was once we started to, to then build out our partner network and we, we got to a point where we said, great, like we already have all the processes in place backed with this f- fantastic technology that could scale facilities. We were in a position to un- essentially unlock the, the, the supply side and uh, work with, with, with partners across the U.S. And, and the globe, where we could level up their existing operations and take over unused space and turn them into a ShipBob facility, and do so in a way that that replicates exact same merchant experience, and and, it, and is tied at the backbone with, with our tech. Right, we're going to go in a second and talk, kind of do a deeper dive into your f- these these partner fulfillment facilities, and not only the physical physically what they look like, but also talk about some of the software and and some of the yeah software behind the scenes, kind of driving everything. But I want to spend a little bit more time on what you just talked about, which is sounds like a very big decision. So just to kind of play it back, obviously you start with building your own warehouses. Um, obviously, it doesn't you know take a lot of thought to realize it's probably very expensive. It's probably very time consuming to build out one of these and get it from zero to one. You're doing this all yourselves. And then you maybe grapple with the decision of, I'm guessing it was something along the lines of, can we scale faster? And would this be a better business across a number of different uh, kind of axes if we were to not own these, rely on other people's physical buildings, and then be able to put our people and put our software in it? But I want to just ask really specifically, what were the challenges you were facing that made you think about moving to a partner shipping facility and how much time did you spend grappling with that because it is clearly you guys made the right decision i also don't imagine it was an easy decision because it was a dramatic change yeah for sure so not not an easy decision <laughs> i'm not sure if it was necessarily a necessary decision but i think in retrospect it's been the right decision but i think the, the biggest thing is like something that the, that we would never sacrifice was the merchant experience and building the company that's that's what we've strive to still strive to do a better job at today and the difficult part was like when you get to this point where you you're okay handing this off to somebody else in part to be able to drive the the same merchant experience and like what would you have to do together and that was that was really difficult and and part of it was having the technology be to a point where it's so system driven and they're so like in a fulfillment center you're dealing with a lot of different, like t- tens of thousands of unique products. And there's, t- you know, like tens of thousands 
of unique combinations that could be packaged so that they're in the right, you know, like tape size, you know, all, all those things to be like perfect to, to the way that somebody wants it going out the door uh, because you're the last hands touching that good before somebody opens it up. So you have all these different po possibilities and you have to create a system that takes a lot of that, if not all the decision making out so that it, it always comes out the same. And that's really difficult in the fulfillment space, especially when, when you're working with anything and everything under the sun in terms of products. Like if you're only shipping, I don't know, t-shirts or only shipping vitamins, like that, that's not too hard to figure out. But when you're, when you're doing anything, everything under the sun, it, it's a really difficult problem to solve. And then once we got to a state of, of we were really confident in technology, it was building the, the processes that, that can make sure that, that runs that technology as well from a management standpoint, and how much Shabab is tapped into it. So that was the, the, like the, the big kind of barrier there. And then it was an, a no brainer once we started to test it out and, and, and made it work because uh, from one end, we were unlocking just the, the supply side of our equation. And there's a, just as there's a need in the, in the, in the, on the merchant side of, of, of having a lot of, you know, having a solution, there's, there's a need on, on the supply side as well. There are companies going through this phase of, they used to be in, you know, kind of more old school distribution and they're catching up in the e-commerce space. Uh, and and uh, there was a sweet spot there as well. Yeah. I want to talk about those warehouses um, and, and kind of take people into them. And partly this is to scratch my own itch. You know, I've never operated a warehouse. Um, I have kind of observed them. I maybe have some superficial idea of what they're like. But I want to talk about that model. And then we're going to talk, I want to talk about the physical kind of the atoms piece of the equation of ShipBob. Um, so the physical warehouses themselves. And then I also want to talk about the bits, which is your warehouse management system and get into some of how that works. On the physical side, is there, you know, so just to maybe tee up an example and push back if this is not right, but let's say you guys are opening up a new warehouse, you find a building that has excess, you know, kind of space and you want to put a ship bob facility inside there. Do you take that uh, real estate as is? Do you, and, and if so, what do you come in and what do you do with it? How do you transform the physical side of the space to make it work within kind of ship bob's warehouse system? Yeah. If you were to walk into like a, a ship bob owned facility versus a partner facility, you probably wouldn't know the difference. Uh, and they're, they're, it's not quite like going from, you know, McDonald's to McDonald's, but it's, it's close to it. And the, the, the model is such that, that we can launch one of these buildings with, with, with minimal investment for, from, from our partners in terms of like infrastructure. And then we have a playbook that is the design of how exactly is, is the rack laid out, how much spacing, what's the, the specific space, what like the, the packing stations, how, how should those be? There's a pretty extensive playbook that, that we go through and we do so in a really quick time frame. If everything's successful, it, it's it's a 90 day cycle uh, from start to finish. That space could like literally sometimes we're, we're just going into a bare bones. There's nothing there and we're starting out and building out the racking infrastructure and putting in Wi-Fi, and, you know, and and uh, when, I, when, I, when I say we were like, we're, 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 this, is, this is the partner doing so through the playbook. And on another, on another phase, that, that stuff is there and we're more so like reconfiguring it to fit um, the model. I want to ask two questions about that kind of playbook for the physical warehouses themselves. One is, you know, how much of that is just industry standard and how much of that has been iterated on just by your team from learnings that you've, that you've had by running so many warehouses at this point in time? For sure. Yeah, it's a combination, but a lot of it is based off of like just data of the products that we, we've shipped out. A lot of metrics around efficiencies and in, in where things should be in the warehouse and how they should be set up. So I would say like 60% of it is, is our internal data. And then 40% uh, is probably like in the industry kind of, you know, best practices. We do a really good job of capturing data of what happens in, in the fulfillment center and drawing conclusions. And that's still evolving. But I would say like we're, we're probably around 80% there of it being consistent for, for what, what happens every day. I want to ask this question really quickly, and we're going to come back to it a little bit later and talk about it a little bit more. But one of the things I was interested in is, you know, this concept of a moat. And we've talked about it before. You touched on it a little bit. One of the things I wanted to ask was, we're going to talk about the warehouse management which is system, which is the software side of this in a second. When you think about the warehouse management system and your physical warehouses in this playbook and the way they're laid out, 
which one is more important when it comes to a moat? You know, is that moat mostly on the software side? Is that moat mostly on the physical side? And then how do you think that will evolve and change over time? It's 100% on the software side, to be honest. Like on, on the physical side, you might not figure it out on day one, but it's not rocket science. Like you, you might need some of the data and stuff like that. But even, yeah, but it, it's, it's 100% on the, on, the, on the software side. And that is is is, is having things just be system driven, taking out decision-making process for, for anyone and, and as high up in, in the management level as you can so that you create uh, a replica, you know, a complicated customized experience that an e-commerce merchant is, is selling that you could replicate that over and over and over. So that's there. And then, I, I, so there's the warehouse management system, there, there, there's actual like space. And the third part that, that is, is our tech is the merchant facing dashboard and then having that 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 tie between the three of a physical action the way it's driven to the wms to then the way it's displayed on the front end to then essentially give that information to the customer who can who can, who can make decisions report to whatever they need to do at a much greater level like almost as if they were running the operations themselves that's very cool. We're going to talk about the software side in a second. I want to talk about the connective tissue for a moment, though, and touch on it, which is when we say that the warehouses run via software, it's not like the robots are doing all of the work. There are humans doing the work. And so I think it'd be important for a second to talk about what the employees, what the team looks like that works inside of the warehouse, and then how they interact with the software. And talking with someone on your team kind of preparing for this interview, it sounds like almost everyone that works on the warehouse floor has an iPod, some sort of device with a screen on it, likely a camera that can read barcodes and stuff on their person all the time, that is obviously their way of interacting with the software, scanning, tracking, everything that's happening. Talk about the human component and then how that works with software when it comes to inside the warehouses. It's a lot of fun. I think like um, I I love the warehouse environment. I I love spending time on the floor. My favorite function in the warehouse space is, is packing. It's almost like arts and crafts to me in a way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, physically in the warehouse, uh, you like, uh, we think about it from like two types of activities. One is that that's stationary where you might be, for example, like counting goods as they're coming through and scanning them through to, to make sure you have the right product. And and then there's uh, like mobile functions where you uh, would go and pick an item or you would go and do a cycle count or something of, of that sort. So anything mobile, you have st- like, an iPod or some devices generally set up in a way that you're almost hands-free and then you, you have a, a, a scanner. And then on the software side, it's very like driven to the point where you, you, you start and finish everything almost with a scan. So there is no, like if you started doing something and halfway through somebody else picking bumped into you and asked you for help and you went back to the screen, there is no way for you to forget what you were doing. Like you have to do the right thing to continue, which gives an error-free process. I think for those folks that are in the in the warehouse, because they're, you know, they're they're the last hands that that, that touch a product and, and they get to, to work with those goods. It's also about making it fun. And there's some, you know, like gamifications and like uh, I think the, the first time like we when, whenever you finish your picking route, you got like a, a cool like screen with a with a goofy like GIF. You know, like people are like, what? Like, how, how, how do they get this image? And, uh, it, it's just a, a, lot, a lot of fun to, and some of the functions that, uh, what, what, what the things that you could do there. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool that you've been able to do with software on that side. So in a second, we're going to talk about some of the algorithms that make up this warehouse management system. And these control things like stowing, packing, uh, batching, uh, just because I think they're super interesting and we can zoom into them in, in a second. But I want to start out with just at a super high level talking about what the warehouse management system is. So we've talked about the physical piece. There's obviously a physical component. There's a physical warehouse with goods stored in different areas. There's a team, but then there's an operating system. And you know, just to frame it up, as you said, in my mind, it almost feels like this is the operating system that control how goods come in, how goods leave, how goods are processed within the center and who works on them and how that all works. And it has a bunch of kind of algorithmic components to it that try to optimize different things that you need to be really good at. Talk just about at a high level, why an operating system for the warehouse was important and how that came about. Absolutely. Just on a, even a really high level, like we we have facilities all over the world. So when you when you have an order and you have product that might be in different parts of the world. Like that decision of like which warehouse ships that order is a really key decision. And and like when do you do it if you if you have 
you can have different rules of like thinking about simply just cost or like your time in transit or, you know, whatever it might be. So I think that, that first is, is like the, the, the very key decision that gets made uh, and it is super important. And, uh, and you're always thinking about how do you get this quicker to your customer and how do you do it for a lower cost? So that is, that is the first key decision. And then one sense in the warehouse and in, in our environment where you have hundreds of people in a facility, it's really important for everybody to know like what is the most important thing to do and what do you do next so that you don't have this position or situation where somebody is is waiting for an answer or waiting for a manager or waiting for, for something like you could just you could just keep going and uh, and uh, yeah so uh, the, the warehouse management system then is central to just from, from a management standpoint like understanding what needs to be done and on our like internal management screens it's really clear to know like like what you've done today, what's in progress, who's doing it. And as you have like X amount of hours left in the day, like, are you going to be able to finish or not? Which is, which is the key, which is you have to make sure that you ship out all your orders out today. So, yeah. And that then like drills down into everything else that, you know, is, is directed by, you know, work, which is more on the, on, on the individual picking packing functions, but it's super interesting. Uh, and uh, you, you, there's, there's a, a lot of room for innovation there. <laughs> it's something that I think I can geek out a little too much on. <laughs> well, I want to ask one more question. So it sounds like, you know, maybe the genesis of the software was once you guys moved from having one facility to having multiple, because as you alluded to there, just to like underscore it, because I think it's really important now that you guys have 36 warehouses, six outside of the U.S., 30 inside the U.S., stuff can be stored at a number of these facilities. So at a high level, there's a really important decision, which is just one, where do we store our customers' goods? <laughs> and then, you know, if we're storing at multiple places, where does it, where does it kind of go or where do, where do we ship it from? Am I getting that right? And is the, did you guys start working on this in the very early days or was this, did this really come about once you guys had multiple warehouses and you had to solve a different problem? The very first thing that, that came about was just inventory management. Like how do we, how do we recognize that we have goods in? And then how do we account for them properly and display that to, to the merchants? So, so that was the origin just in, you know, in, in one warehouse, which was a garage <laughs> of making sure that, you know, we could, we could, we could do that efficiently. And then as that grew, like that, then it became about efficiency. Like how do you not, not only like, how do you store the product and account for it properly, but how do you get it out the door, you know, efficiently and, and know who did what. And then that evolved into then the decision of like which facility and then building logic into time in transit, the cost, building logic about inbound costs and like the, the full like landed cost of a good and a lot of the decision-making process there. And then as, as the facilities grew and like, uh, you know, as, as companies go through different phases and if they were doing this on their own, like this is, this is the challenges they face is you, you get to a point where you've outgrown this like space, which is maybe like 20,000 square feet or so where you can stand on the floor and like see everyone and what they're doing. Then it's, uh, how do you, how, how do you manage all of that, you know, from, from your computer screen? And then that becomes a much, you know, more in-depth logic that you need to build out of running a facility. Yeah, that sounds like a massive challenge. <laughs> I want to talk for a second about some of the algorithms that are a part of this warehouse management system, because I think it's fascinating. It also gives, I think it kind of underscores two things. One, how difficult, again, fulfillment is going back to that theme, because there's just so many things that have to be done well to be able to fulfill a customer's promise. One of the things we, maybe we can start with is the stowing algorithm. So for someone who's never operated a warehouse, what is stowing? Why is there a stowing algorithm? What does it do? <laughs> yeah, so stowing is the function where after you've acknowledged the goods are in your facility and you've counted them, then now you're going to put them on a shelf. And, it, it, uh, and the next process is that somebody will, will pick it from there. What you're facing with is knowing where to put it in the facility so that you, you're, for example, like if you had a pallet of products that pallet fits in that rack or if you have a couple of boxes that they fit in that shelf so that's the first part of that, of that like decision making algorithm and then the second piece is like how quickly is that product moving and where are the other products that ship with it or for that client etc so that it's in the same relative facility of, of the warehouse so that for the next step where somebody is is going to go and like pick that item they don't have to walk very far to be able to to you know combine one of that item plus another item in, into the order so there's a lot of different kind of decision criteria there, but it's a fun problem <laughs> to, to have. And then the, the, 
what, what you're looking at, and, and that's like on the inbound side of things, the, the efficiency is, is obviously it's measured, but it's probably not as scrutinized as well as like the effectiveness versus uh, uh, like there's probably a little more like focus on the efficiency of the outbound side of operations um, because, uh, yeah, like the, the, the opportunity for an error there is almost impossible. Yeah, you're more time compressed, and obviously that's the the thing you need to deliver on. I want to talk about two more examples, um, and then if there's another, we can we can go on to that. But you talked about uh, picking. Is there a picking algorithm? What is picking? What's entailed there, and, and what does the algorithm handle? Yeah, picking is when uh, our team is essentially assembling that order and uh, putting it in a some sort of tote or you know bin for it to be transferred to a station where it will be packaged. And the algorithm there is is looking for efficiency into looking at all the orders that you have in, in that facility for that day and one like prioritizing them based on like um like delivery like if there's a certain cutoff like if some orders need to be out the door quicker than others based on a certain cutoff and then the second piece that it's looking at is the algorithm is trying to optimize for efficiency for visiting the least amount of locations to be able to complete for example like a set of 50 orders which as that facility grows and, and you know and, and you go from 50 to like a 300,000 to you know millions of square feet like that walking time could be a dramatic <laughs> walk so trying to, to, to minimize you know those, those steps are, are all things that, that, that the picking algorithm kind of touches on and it's uh, yeah it's pretty fascinating Talk about one more. I'm going to try to combine these two. You talked a little bit about before there's a packaging algorithm. And obviously, I think everyone kind of understands what that is. You're looking for the right size package for whatever you want to, you want to have. But the another one that, that sounded related that was interesting is a batching algorithm. And I think you just touched on that a little bit. Can you talk a little about those two components, what they do, and why those are important? Yeah. So the way we think about batching is if, uh, if you were to have a flash sale today and sold, I don't know, a thousand orders, maybe maybe 200 of those orders, the exact same makeup of order, going to 200 different, like 100 people ordered the same type of t-shirt. And for us, there is an efficiency algorithm that, that looks at organizing these orders in uh, in a way that, like, it, it's, it's not simply just like, it's everybody ordered a t-shirt, let's get them all and like get them all at the same time. You're looking at things as well as like those cutoff times and availability of, of where those goods are on the shelf, for example, like you, you might you might not have a, a, like a pickable position that has all those units together and you might have a more efficient way to do it. But ultimately, like if you could, if you had 200 orders of, 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 of one product and you're able to go to one location and pick 200 of those items and then label those and pack them all, it is one of the most efficient, you know, processing paths. And uh, yeah, there, there's a, a pretty complex algorithm at looking at all those orders and then creating like a workflow so that eliminates decision-making of like, of uh, do I group these two together or not, or do I ship them now or later? You know, so those are things that we geek out on all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's it's fascinating just to get a little bit of a deeper dive into some of these hyper. You know, they're, these are clearly very hyper specific areas, but they're also areas where they have an enormous amount of value to optimize it. And so having one, an algorithm just for that thing, but then having all of these algorithms that work together in an operating system, I think it's just a really powerful concept. I think it's super interesting from like an engineering standpoint because a lot of, of you know, what, what you do in an engineering environment is not always like physically a- applicable, but in a warehouse environment, like you're you're tangibly like affecting somebody's life of what they have to do every single day by that like line of code and that, and that logic that you're writing. So yeah, it, it's super interesting. I want to ask maybe two final questions on when it comes to the, the software side. And the first one is, you know, thinking about this, and this is just going to be a guess. So if I'm wrong, please, please correct me. But, you know, one of my guesses is that today, one of the reasons that ShipBob does really well is if I'm a merchant and say I go and ship with, with UPS, you know, we're all familiar with trying to track a package. It's not very granular and you often have no idea what's happening with that package. One of the things I would guess from you guys owning, you guys have full stack built not only the warehouses where you store everything, you've built the software, and then this warehouse software links with obviously the merchant dashboard. Talk a little bit about that loop, because I'm guessing that for merchants, they, they have much more granular data. It's probably a much better experience. Am I right there? And what do you hear from merchants about why ShipBob is such a better experience? For sure. Yeah, that's actually, you tapped on like one, I think one of the key things there is a difference maker 
for uh, e-commerce merchants, you Shabab, and it, it is that level of tracking. And it starts, you mentioned, you know, like like that, that handoff with UPS, but it starts even earlier from the moment where um, uh, inventory like is dropped off by a UPS or, uh, you know, a, a 53 foot truck to our, to our facility, you, you get a, a, an update essentially, almost like a tracking number. This, this has arrived, that these products are counted, that they've been put in a certain location. And then is that when you get an order, we're pulling that order from, you know, your, your WooCommerce Shopify store. And then when it's going through the fulfillment steps of being picked, packed and shipped, you can get those status updates. You can even push those back to your end customer and say, hey, John, just pick this order. You know, it's it's not too late to like add something <laughs> uh, to, to your order. You know, it's about to ship out. Like some folks have gone really deep into, you know, customizing that experience, but all, all those points are available, you know, in, in our tech and our API. And then it goes further into that handoff with the carrier, which is a big event where uh, we're going through several scans to make sure that this package is in the in the right Gaylord to be to go with that carrier. That Gaylord is the right dock door to be picked up with that carrier. That carrier picked it up. And when when you know like a carrier comes and picks up tens of thousands of shipments at our facilities, you know, or, or our fulfillment center, they're unable to scan every single one and give you that you know active like it's been picked up. But we have these three series of events that ensures that we gave it to the right carrier and at the right time. Very cool. I'm going to ask one more question, which is around software development. This one might be harder for you to answer because you're not an engineer overseeing the development of the software. But one of the questions that I had there was, you know, I imagine that this is, you have a team of engineers that's working on this warehouse management system that's probably pushing out changes and updates every single day. Does it, is it, are they shipping in real time? Are they more batching and releasing these updates? Because you obviously, there's a human component. You might need to retrain people. How does the software interact with kind of a human? Yeah. It's evolved over time, <laughs> uh, and 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 we're at a state where you know it's 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 weekly, and and it, the, the products are being shipped, and obviously for 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 things that that affect the warehouse operation and are changing somebody's daily workflow, that there's an entire team that has this like go to market strategy essentially for for that. Uh, but yeah, it, it greatly evolved. Like in in the early days, like we would have a Wednesday stand up where the engineers would demo stuff, and then. Thursday, they'll deploy things or Friday or whenever they, they thought their code was bug free. So greatly, greatly evolved. Like the, the, the hats off to an entire technology group and, and the things they developed to, to ensure that that we're still developing new things and pushing new things out and able to to service, you know, like tremendous volume and, you know, and things like even through, you know, Cyber Weekend and stuff like that, which is a, a big engineering feat. So hats off to them. Yeah. Well, and to your point, I mean, I imagine, you know, one of the worst things that could happen would be to push a bug that then disables all of your warehouses or slows them down or <laughs> introduces issues. So it's a very, it's a very high bar. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to wrap up by talking about two things. We'll talk in a moment about lessons learned. I always like to end with that. What I want to kind of transition to now is talking about your role at ShipBob. You know, and at ShipBob for a number of years now, you've been responsible for strategic projects. And we're going to go through one of those projects in a moment. And I want to talk about the kind of physical implications, the, the software implications, and, and kind of how that ended up getting shipped. But one of the things I wanted to start with is, you know, your title is strategic projects. Talk a little bit about how you think about strategy and how you think about strategy in a tangible way. Obviously, you and your team are responsible for moving the strategic objectives forward. Not many people are in that role. How do you think about strategy maybe differently than most of us do? I'm not sure if I can speak about the difference, but I, I can tell you how I think about it. <laughs> but yeah, so like there's an organization like ours, there, there's a lot of different business units at, at the scale and a lot of different cool, exciting initiatives that are happening all the time. So what our, our department and, and, and what I try to do is to, to focus on uh, bigger long-term initiatives where we, 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 we would develop something that is a course of a year, multiple years that becomes a business unit or becomes absorbed to, into a company that dramatically changes the company. So originally this department started out as the idea of, you know, having a startup within our startup for, you know, because there's companies starting out today that are looking at ShipBob or somebody like ShipBob and saying they're doing something inefficient, I could disrupt them. So uh, we have to compete and say ahead of those folks. And, it, and it, it's something that, you know, that I'm just frankly really passionate about. But, so what I think about is just the, the overall all 
e-commerce space and, and what, what's, what's going on and where markets and opportunities where we have strengths from all the things that we've developed, the warehouse management system, the network of facilities, all the partners, all the relationships, all those things that have been built out over the, the, the past eight years. And how does that now overlap or, or change the game for what we could do into the future? And then also like, where's that gap? So like uh, recently we've been thinking about an underserved segment essentially in the e-commerce space it is, is fo- um, uh, folks that are, are, are doing self-fulfillment, but they would like to potentially be able to outsource fulfillment, but they're, they're kind of stuck. They're in a warehouse lease that have staff and, um, and whether so, some of those folks love doing that, some, some of them may not, but like, how, how do you help those people level up their game? How do you help them get to the next level? Uh, of logistics in the e-commerce space. And yeah, and, and uh, the most recent project that, that we worked on has, has, been, uh, has been tapped into solving that. Fascinating. I want to talk about one of those examples, uh, one of those example projects that you worked on, which was cost-effective two-day fulfillment. You talked at the beginning of the episode about people are always going to want things faster. Or people are always going to want things cheaper. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with that. And also this, uh, this idea of how do you help merchants be able to compete with that? Because it's very hard to do on your own. So, you know, it sounds like maybe that didn't used to exist with ShipBob. You saw that as an opportunity. So maybe I'll, I'll just stop there. Talk about that project, the origins of it. And then I would love to know, just kind of walk us through the development and execution. And if you could touch on the physical, any thing that changed about how you handled warehouses and anything that changed out of that about the software side of the equation, just to kind of thread that needle all the way for people listening. Yeah, that was one of like the, the first projects that, that we tackled. And those two facts of like, it is what rooted that, that, that cause and problem. And that's something that's going to continue, you know, going forward. And it's something that our industry and, and, and Shibab is focused on continuously improving. But in the, in the origin frame, like we were, I think, at a position of like four facilities at the time. And uh, we were looking at, uh, and, 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 and folks were coming to us for it, like they, they would like to be in a position to distribute their inventory across the US to, to achieve that, to essentially be able to ship your goods from the closest location possible to the end consumer, which would get there quicker and also be more cost effective. But they didn't know how, how to do it. So like the, the solution is like, if you're, if you're ordering, you know, in, in Milwaukee, that, that hopefully we're shipping it from, you know, somewhere close to you in Wisconsin, and if and and, and that's gonna be able to get there, uh, you know, super low cost. And and I guess the way to think about this in, in the broader space, like in logistics, and uh, is you have like three miles of the logistics process. The first mile is like getting that uh, that shipment picked up into like a a sortation hub. And then it's from that sortation hub to like the delivery hub is the second mile, the middle mile. And then the final mile is from that hub to your front door. And the closer that you can optimize that experience just to be like that final mile is the big threshold, then delivery becomes significantly less expensive and quicker. So folks were in the space and working with Shiba, but and they wanted to take advantage of our multiple facilities, but they didn't know how to do so. And it, it's a difficult problem to solve when you when you have a lot of different products uh, because you have to manage your inventory levels and position them and make sure that like your your lead times uh, are, are sufficient to to have product in hand. But but ultimately, like the problem was there, <laughs> and uh, the 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 need was there, and uh, we started to to brainstorm like how do we execute on this internally. And came up with several different strategies. At the most basic, we're like, well, what, what if we just like shipped everything to the air? And like, what if we could just negotiate like super low rates or something with that? And that that didn't really work out. <laughs> uh, but we we, we tried it, uh, and then we got into a position of being uh, able to distribute inventory for clients and to start to manage that for them. And we started out with a super small project. We had like six merchants that, that signed up, and we were able to do this proof of concept where they would send us their product to the east west or west coast and then we place it in facilities and then we tracked over time like did we that there are predictions of how you'd sell through this and this all work out uh, and that ended up growing um, over time and becoming the, the Shibab express product offering and then over time th- that then evolved from like okay great now we could achieve this piece of uh, quicker delivery how do you communicate this 
up funnel? How do you get this to the to the person buying to to know that they could get this in two days and that it will be like low cost? And then, yeah, it, th that was the kind of evolution from it. It's 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 a piece of of Shibab that's still evolving and growing, but the origins were were simply by 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 having folks uh, figure out how to distribute their inventory across the country. Yeah. And just one more question, because, you know, you guys as a business have this really fascinating footprint where you might have to for, to roll out something like this. I don't know if it's true. It sounds like maybe part of the strategy was cool. We have enough warehouses. We have East and West Coast. Now from here, we can just add more density and it's just going to improve and shipping's going to get better. But I guess what the question I want to ask is, did that work? You know, so saying, OK, we're going to go and do this. We're going to go do two day shipping. Did you then have to go and figure out how does this show up or how does this change the warehouse management system? And how does this change the physical warehouse? And what does that process look like? Maybe you just work with those engineering teams, but I'd be curious for a little bit of. Yeah, like the, the approach that, that I took at the time was like, how do, how do we do this in a way that minimizes any change? Like, like what, you know, like at, at first I, we did things manual, but, but then it needs to be in a way where like the, the, the warehouse associate like has no idea that anything changed. They, they just went about and picked another order and it might've been a ship up to the express order. But that order had to go out the door a certain time frame and it had to be a specific carrier and, and all those things. So from the tech standpoint, like the first gap was making sure that we have that decision tree of, of where an order flows into. And then uh, the, the second piece w w was to make sure it, it's mapped and minimized, in, you know, in, in the same in the same way to the, to the associate. Behind the scenes, like I had random dashboards to, to, to walk, you know, <laughs> to make sure that all this is working, and, you know, and the red flag reports and emails going out. But for, for the folks actually using it, it had to be a really seamless experience where like they didn't know anything changed pretty much. Yeah. No, well said. I mean, I think it, it clearly makes sense. It sounds like the change at the time you were trying to do almost minimum viable or minimum effective dose of change. So it's like, how do we ship this, but not actually change a lot of what we do? I could ask a million more questions uh, because I think that what you're building is super fascinating. And it's a fast, fascinating business. Um, but I want to close out by asking about lessons learned. And, you know, I think the, the question that I want to start with there is you've been building ship Bob for eight years now. In startup years, eight years is somewhat of an eternity. And I imagine you've gone through a lot of periods and chapters and growth curves uh, during that time. I think it'd be interesting if you could start with just talking about one or two big lessons that you've taken away over the last eight years. And if there's a story you can share about a, you know, uh, just a really positive moment or a really difficult moment in that eight year journey. And I'm sure there's a lot to choose from. <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot of lessons along the way. <laughs> um I think one of of the the key lessons is uh, has been to to have uh, utmost transparency with your 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 team and your, and your clients, and it's, it's it's a difficult thing to do sometimes because of I don't know like you don't want you don't you don't want like your client to know what's going on under the hood and, and the especially like in an early day you just want to make sure that they you know that you get what what you promise them but not necessarily how it happened. <laughs> but ultimately, like uh, transparency to, to your customers is like extremely important, no, no matter how difficult it is to display. And even if the information is bad, I think it, it, uh, it's, it's, it's super important. So one of the ways that, that we've uh, publicized that is we, 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 like at Shibab, we have a, a Shibab, data.shibab.com or SLAs, and they're, and they're public. So you could see our performance, good or bad, like, like how it is through, through the network. And internally, this, doing the same thing with your staff, like as you're going through difficult times and evolution as a company, being brutally honest about financials or, or like what's going on, so that and and it's it's sometimes it's difficult to share difficult information, and it might be in some cases demoralizing. It might seem that way, but at the end of the day, like I think if your staff has the same information that you have when you're making a decision, they're going to be significantly more comfortable with the decision made and. After the fact, if you have to course correct or whatever it may be, so like that that's that's been a a, a key lesson uh, through through uh, I think the the journey. Um, and then uh, in terms of 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 I, I'll start with a low moment, and then <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll, I'll hit yeah hit, hit some highs. <laughs> but in a low moment, we were uh, when we were raising our Series A. It was a really difficult time and it was before like e-commerce really had the wave or even like 
like th this is a time when like if you were to talk about Shopify, people would be like, well, when does Spotify like do store? Like it, it was a it was a weird <laughs> weird time, and uh, we had pitched in front of you know a lot of folks for funds, and we were towards the towards the end of the, the runway for Shibab, and we're doing a lot of difficult things inside to you know to make sure that. We are essentially we had to be we got to become profitable or, or raise funds. So and then we ended up doing both, but like the the, the path to get there w w was really difficult. And uh, yeah, and I have the fondest memories with, with, with teammates during that time to uh, that you know that went through it and that did all the the hard work, late nights, and sacrifice things you know to make sure that the company survives and the vision survives. On the high note. Uh, I mean, this for me is like every, every day and, 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 and like the high note is in two parts. One is like, I have the coolest job, I think, by, by, by being able to send to, to these strategic initiatives, but talking to our merchants and talking to entrepreneurs, like literally every single day and hearing their stories of how they got found out about their company and how like people, you know, on their last, you know, funds that they, you know, they, they saved for X amount of years about this cool idea and they started and they, they were sleeping on top of their inventory, their inventory in their bed and they started out fulfillment and, you know, their business grew and now, and now, you know, they're bringing commerce to like somewhere in, in North Dakota that they don't really have much commerce in them. Like these stories are just like so humbling and so empowering and, and being able to help these entrepreneurs and be a part of their, their growth is just absolutely like, it, it's, it's the highlight of this job and this journey all the time. And the second one in the same in a similar vein is like is employees and staff that we've gotten to work with and and the warehouse and e-commerce like environment like it, it the, the warehouse environment is a place where you could not have any education show up to work work hard be consistent and you and you will quickly get promoted in this space so seeing company uh, like people that have joined our team that, that like folks that uh, an individual that started as a janitor in our LA Fulfillment Center, uh, and then became an associate and then a manager, and and now they're like a, a regional manager now. Like that, that that journey for someone that you know is just it's incredible. And being at a part of a, a company and a mission to to be, to be able to create that opportunity is just it it yeah it's the highest of my days. Yeah, so cool. Well, it sounds like eight years in, you're still just as excited as you were in the earliest days, which is good. <laughs> it's a good sign. We're just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for the time, Jifko. This has been one of my favorite conversations. Um, thanks for making time to join. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. You can learn more about ShipBob, including their global omni-fulfillment solution that's trusted by over 7,000 brands who use it to ship orders everywhere their customers shop at shipbob.com. You can find a searchable transcript of this episode, as well as our episode guide with ways to dive deeper at outlieracademy.com slash 138. That's outlieracademy.com 138. For more from Outlier Academy, follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and TikTok. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash outlieracademy, or visit outlieracademy.com for more incredible Outlier founder episodes, profiling incredible companies like Forward, 8Sleep, Common Stock, Varda Space Industries, Superhuman, Primal Kitchen, 1-800-GOT-JUNK, and many, many more. In every interview, we deconstruct the ideas, frameworks, and strategies they use to build these incredible companies. We'll see you right here with a brand new episode of Outlier Academy next Wednesday.